So we are moving to the next plenary talk uh, to be given by uh, David Smith from uh, Duke University, he's, where he is a distinguished professor. Uh, of course, we all know that the whole field of metamaterials is largely uh, due to uh, David's uh, truly pioneering breakthrough work with his uh, very first demonstration of left-handed materials, uh, negative refractive index clocking, and we could, of course, uh, keep this list going on and on. So please join me uh, with welcoming David. Uh, well, I thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to talk. Uh, this is a different sort of talk. It was meant to be in the session initially that was uh, uh, geared towards applications of metamaterials. Uh, so it became a, uh, a talk here. Uh, it's probably a good place for it, uh, just because it's, uh, I'm going to talk sort of broadly in the beginning of the talk. Uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll skip to uh, a, a more specific application as an example of what I'm talking about. But uh, today I'm representing, uh, I'm at Duke University in the uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but I'm also uh, going to be talking about um, uh, a company called Intellectual Ventures and some of the work we're doing there on commercialization or transition of metamaterials into uh, real applications. Uh, one of the things that I remember very well from Eli Yablanovich, who uh, uh, started the, the field of photonic crystals, uh, over and over, he'd admonish people, we have to find a killer application for what we're doing. And so the same thing for metamaterials. Metamaterials has now been around since uh, uh, 2000, maybe a little before, at least as a term, around 2000. And uh, at some point, it needs to transition into real world uh, uh, applications, things that, that uh, help people or people actually want to buy. So that's some of the work that I've been doing in the past few years to try to uh, facilitate and, and see that happen. Lucky enough to work with uh, a lot of people that are, have the same mindset that want to see this transition. So what I'll say is I didn't have time. Uh, I actually went to Gibraltar yesterday. So I didn't have time to put uh, uh, the contributions of everyone in here that should be in here, uh, list them by name. But uh, if, you, if, if you see anything and you're not interested, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you are interested, just send me an email and I'll tell you who did what in this if I fail to mention it as I go along. So uh, our group has been involved in, in many uh, different uh, uh, activities. Um, these are just some of the projects we have going on. I'm not going to talk about the optics work today, but we're interested very strongly in plasmonics as well as nonlinear optics. Uh, I'm going to talk today really, of course, uh, transformation optics and, and cloaking are, are uh, long-term interests uh, of ours. Uh, but we also have some applied projects uh, that are, are now helping to facilitate uh, and looking at more systems-oriented applications of metamaterials, including things like uh, microwave imaging using metamaterials and uh, metasurfaces for uh, synthetic ap aperture radar, which is something that I hope to talk a little bit about. So uh, uh, just as a broad introduction, what are metamaterials? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can think about this. Uh, these are just some pictures of things we've done in our lab uh, that we uh, consider metamaterials, but there's no really specific uh, definition because it's not a thing. It's more of a design concept, and it's always been kind of a design concept for us, uh, in which we replace uh, initially atoms and molecules with macroscopic structured elements that act as uh, dipoles. Uh, so it sort of mimics material response. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that and a lot of things you can use that for, uh, but it's a very enabling uh, type of technique because it, makes, it allows you to make structures uh, that can be very quickly analyzed, uh, so it sort of speeds your, your, your uh, uh, development of, of uh, larger concepts. Negative index is one example, hyperbolic media, many other things. Uh, uh, you don't have to any longer think about the microscopic picture of what you're making. You can get these interesting... Uh, materials once you just know the basic principles. And um, those basic principles are, are, are a few elements. These are uh, some elements you can think of. There's many, many others. Uh, but you can get magnetic response and electric response uh, just from a few elements that look like this. 
Uh, when we started uh, in metamaterials, uh, what was pretty common was volumetric materials, things that make, look like this, and these are, this is an array of split ring resonators. Uh, but it, it wasn't necessary. A lot of people started thinking about uh, uh, surfaces and, and things like this, where you take the complementary version. In fact, a lot of that work was started here in Spain. You take the complementary versions of your uh, 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 metamaterial elements. So, for example, you might have a split ring here, and this is meant to be copper. Uh, you can take the complement of that, so you have like a screen or a metal uh, surface, and you uh, uh, hollow out or put vacuum uh, to make your, your resonator. And then you have, again, a, a very similar type of uh, uh, response, except it, it, uh, you get sort, uh, sort of the Babinet equivalent. Uh, magnetic response turns to an electric response. And then you have something like an ELC resonator, which gives you an electric response if you have these elements. Uh, the complement of that gives you a magnetic response. And that turns out to be important if you start thinking about surfaces, because uh, if anyone's familiar with antenna theory, uh, a magnetic response or a magnetic dipole on a ground plane is a good radiator, whereas uh, an electric uh, uh, element is not. So in fact, uh, things that are complementary often you'll see with uh, ELCs because they, they actually radiate better and they give you uh, inherent magnetic response. Again, these are for guided wave structures uh, and those turn out to be very interesting for reasons I'll talk about in a second. So. Uh, while we started in volumetric metamaterials, um, it's not a good place to look initially for applications because you have to uh, propagate through a lot of material. And uh, initially, one of the concerns was losses in metamaterials. You often are dealing with resonant structures. And so all of the cool and interesting effects like negative index uh, tend to not scale well as your material gets larger and larger because they also uh, access a resonance and they become very lossy. Um, so, when you start thinking about what might be a good application, surfaces are a great thing to think about because you don't have to propagate very far through them. And then you say, well, what can I do with the surface? Well, uh, immediately what comes to mind are things like uh, optics. Uh, so you have a lot of different type of optics and you don't have to propagate through very much material. Is that a good application? Well, it turns out to be a great application uh, because wavefront management and uh, managing electromagnetic uh, radiation turns out to be a very, very important uh, concept and an increasingly important concept uh, from a practical point of view. So these, these are just some things that you could do with optics. Um, now you start thinking of uh, metasurfaces and ask what uh, benefit can metamaterials or metasurfaces bring uh, to optics? And a lot of this work is, is being done uh, in the optics. Uh, and uh, very successfully, but it can be done across the spectrum. And you can start to say, uh, what uh, sorts of things can we do uh, that might be new or useful? So um, one of the things that uh, immediately comes to mind is holography. Uh, it's a very simple concept. You can take a reference wave, uh, and if you interfere it uh, with a source, you'll create an interferogram, and then if you illuminate that interferogram, you can reproduce the source. So this is a good way to design a lens, for example. Uh, this interferogram that I'm showing here will produce something like a Fresnel lens, and if you could reproduce that uh, intensity or, or amplitude and phase profile, then you've created a lens. So it's a very, very simple path to lens design, and you can create these uh, 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 types of, of response uh, uh, phase and amplitude using metasurfaces. Again, is it a good thing? Is it different? Well, we can wait and find out, uh, but the point is we can do it, uh, and so it's a good thing to start with. Uh, to get a really efficient optic, you need to uh, wrap the phase from 0 to 2 pi. That's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you don't have to, though. Uh, you can get away with some uh, uh, approximations to this. So the question is, can you reproduce this using a metamaterial? And uh, this is one of the types of things, I won't go into, I don't have time for a lot of detail here, but this is uh, one approach to creating a, a hologram. This is using volumetric in a sense, uh, which is just to create an artificial dielectric material uh, and uh, uh, use a few layers of it to bring up your, to make sure that you have a zero to two pi or, or, or so forth uh, uh, phase difference where you need it. So you can create uh, your desired image and if you're in the uh, appropriate limit, you can uh, uh, take the Fourier transform of that to find out what uh, phase distribution you need in the image plane. 
So then you need uh, a surface that will create that phase distribution. This is equivalent to your, your interferogram, and you can make it with a metamaterial here just using elements, uh, artificial elements, to, to give you uh, index. And so this was a, a, an attempt to make a dual polarization hologram, uh, two different types of uh, uh, images for the different polarizations. And here I'm just using a simple cross structure and changing uh, the length of either cross to get the desired uh, effective index. And so this is kind of a volumetric hologram, and it works. It works pretty well. There's a lot of other ways of doing this. Some of the experts in this field are actually here. Uh, you don't need metamaterials to do this, but you can do it with metamaterials, so that's kind of nice. And uh, this uh, shows a, a picture of the actual structure that was made, a close-up so you can see uh, the few layers. It was kind of a process, won't go into the details, uh, but it works. If you have one polarization here, uh, you see Duke, and if you see the other polarization, you see a, 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 that's the Duke Blue Devil, for those of you that don't know. And if you're in between, you can see a, a combination of both. So that works. Uh, but it's a multi-layer structure. Um, so now the question is, could you do it with a single layer? Uh, and this is a little bit more recent work. This is done at 100 gigahertz. The last uh, structure was done at 1.5 microns. So this is a different type of uh, uh, metasurface. Now this is a complementary metasurface. This is a meander wire, which gives a, a kind of a, a magnetic response in plane. Uh, and uh, as you zoom in, you can see that we've create, we're creating a hologram by just uh, changing the properties of this little meander wire. Uh, uh, in this case, it's a resonant metasurface or resonant metamaterial, so that we are actually accessing the phase. Uh, so in this structure like this, because it's a resonator, we can get a zero to pi phase shift. Uh, so we're not going to have a perfect hologram. Uh, this is done for 100 uh, gigahertz. And if we look at the properties of this, uh, you can see that uh, by tuning these properties, you, you change where the resonance is. And if you look particularly at the phase, uh, you can see that you can get uh, uh, roughly, in this case, we were minus 60 to, to plus 60 degrees. Um, you're tied, because of the Lorentzian uh, of a resonator, you're tied to a, an amplitude response that you may not want or desire, but it turns out in, in holography and diffractive optics, the phase is much more important, so this variation really doesn't matter too much until it goes to zero and you don't have any uh, uh, transmission. And so here's a, an example of the design. Uh, you have a reference phase, so this is a beam coming in uh, to the surface. Uh, and uh, the image that you want, uh, and then after a little bit of optimization, which again I won't go through, uh, you can do the measurement and then you can see uh, that we can recover the, the image. Uh, and we're also getting a zeroth order because we, we haven't been able to reject it here. We haven't tried to reject it, uh, but you can see uh, that, that, that Duke. And this is, this is about to be published, I guess, as soon as Optics Express cashes the, uh, the check. This is the way they work. Uh, anyway. Uh, you can see that uh, 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 this sort of metasurface actually can give you uh, uh, an image. It can be used as an optical device. And uh, in fact, it, it's uh, uh, just a single layer, and that's kind of interesting. So this is the idea of, of uh, making a hologram. But there's another way of doing it. This was uh, what I've just showed you is coming in with a beam, sort of classical holography as your reference. But it doesn't have to be a beam. It could be, for example, a guided mode. And a guided mode, a waveguide mode, uh, as a reference, turns out to be very interesting because it uh, is a little bit more packaged and a little bit closer to something that could be a useful application. So here, for example, is a, a waveguide. Uh, I'm just uh, exciting it with a, uh, um, uh, for example, I might put a probe in the back, of a, in the back plate and, and launch a cylindrical wave. If I put a metasurface here, uh, where I can uh, add a phase shift or an amplitude at every point on the reference wave, then I've created, uh, uh, I can create my hologram, my computer hologram uh, here, and I can create whatever uh, far field pattern, or maybe not even far field pattern, I might want something in the near zone. Uh, whatever I want, I can make by just writing in the proper pattern, uh, patterns of, uh, uh, in this case, CELCs, but whatever element we want. So now this is a very interesting sort of antenna. Uh, now, is it a useful antenna? Uh, it, it can be. Uh, here's how we might uh, do some tuning. So there's a couple of things we could do. We could, uh, for example, switch things on and off. 
If we find any way to modulate these, we can make it a reconfigurable antenna, a dynamic uh, hologram. So for example, uh, I'm showing you that if I change the geometry, I can switch where this resonance is. That's understandable. Also, if I put anything like a dielectric who I, who's a, a dielectric constant I can tune by any external modulation, uh, then I can do this dynamically. And there's a lot of ways to do that. A lot of the research in the community has is, is been working towards how to make uh, reconfigurable metamaterials. Lots of ways I can do things. I can change the resonance frequency. I can change the damping. I can change the coupling. There's a bunch of knobs to turn. Uh, I can do this as on-off, or I could potentially uh, uh, do it uh, uh, in what my, we call grayscale, which is to, if you could uh, tune this and actually access different amplitude layers. Or I could actually, uh, actually access uh, the phase shift in, in a, one of these structures, like I did in the previous example. So here's how you might make uh, an antenna. This is a, a guided wave uh, coming down a microstrip. Uh, the wave uh, looks like this, and uh, it excites these metamaterials uh, elements, and they radiate like little magnetic dipoles. Um, so I can put everything together uh, in a very simple way and write uh, this, the equivalent of what's called an array factor in antenna theory. Uh, and I'll, I'll compare these in a second, uh, but I can now treat this as an antenna. I can just say, maybe I want a beam going in some direction. I can come back and say what distribution of, of magnetic moments I want on this thing. Uh, I know how to design that using uh, ELCs. I know what the reference wave is, and so putting it all together, I can get uh, whatever pattern I want out of this thing. So I'll stop there for the technical portion. That's now I've created an antenna. Uh, so now if you want to uh, move into applications, the question that you want to ask is, what is it good for? And that's actually not a, a thing that we're great at at a university. Um, we're great at the first part, uh, but we're not so good at figuring out who's going to buy it and doing the marketing. So luckily I was working with a company called Intellectual Ventures, uh, uh, and they're built around a number of different funds. Uh, part of their initial model was to aggregate uh, intellectual property and license it to other companies. Uh, but in the case of metamaterials, they had started building a portfolio on metamaterials in uh, the Invention Science Fund, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is one of their funds that was a little bit more, uh, became a little bit more focused on actually bringing value uh, to uh, the portfolios. And we started something that we called the Metamaterials Commercializ Commercialization Center and started looking at uh, uh, potential opportunities for metamaterials. And in fact, uh, this structure here that I've just talked about was one that was uh, developed by Nathan Kuntz, who actually went to um, Intellectual Ventures and, and started looking and making a list of, of potential uh, uh, commercial opportunities. So uh, as a result of this, um, uh, they listed a number of uh, potential commercial opportunities. And uh, some of them looked pretty good, so they went forward and actually did a demonstration. So this was the first uh, uh, lab demo that was done actually at Intellectual Ventures. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure I hit the right button. Uh, this is exactly what I showed you. This is a one-dimensional waveguide, microstrip type. Uh, they fed microwaves in one direction. Uh, you see the ELC elements here. Uh, and the method of tuning uh, that they decided on using was liquid crystal. So this is a liquid crystal based uh, uh, system. Uh, you can see the, the bias lines here. You apply a voltage uh, to the liquid crystal, you reorient uh, its axis, and you get a dielectric change. So this was the first example of a dynamically reconfigurable antenna. So why liquid crystal? There's a lot of other ways of doing it. Uh, liquid crystal is interesting because it leverages a, a multi-billion dollar uh, fabrication uh, uh, that, that exists for uh, liquid crystal display panels, for example, uh, many other uh, types. Uh, they, this actually, this slide is from Intellectual Ventures. Uh, they considered a number of different things, and you can see the pluses and minuses, at, at least at the time, reactors, pin diodes. Uh, these things, I think, will all eventually be used and are being used, uh, but liquid crystal was an interesting one because of the potential uh, to leverage very mature uh, uh, fabrication technology. So when you start thinking about applications, one of the things that you want to think about is how manufacturable a structure will be and what its cost is. 
uh, and the uh, LC, uh, if you can leverage that, certainly has a lot of advantages, including making tons and tons of elements and making them addressable. So uh, just a nice picture that I found. Uh, something like this is really not that expensive. And if you were to think of that as a metamaterial or as a reconfigurable metamaterial, you're starting to look at uh, uh, the possibility of, of, of really addressing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of elements, and have it not be expensive. Uh, and that was part of the play is why that was so interesting for intellectual ventures at the time. So that uh, study uh, was, uh, uh, came in the context of looking at a lot of different opportunities uh, and the one that went out initially was uh, satellite communications, because as it turns out, there weren't really uh, any good alternatives to satellite communication. You have uh, potentially uh, gimbal dishes, which are heavy and, and expensive, or phased arrays, and I'll tell you a little bit in a couple seconds as to why phased arrays are not a great solution uh, and why they weren't uh, picked up for satellite uh, uh, communication. So this became Chimeta. Uh, this was spun out, and Nathan Kuntz, former postdoc in our group, uh, is, is now the CEO of Chimeta. It has about 150 employees. Um, and this is a little bit of the roadmap uh, since 2012. They were started in 2010. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, this is so starting with a sort of a lab level discovery, they call it discovery, uh, to where they are now. Uh, this is a printed circuit board version. Uh, this is one that was done, with, uh, again, using uh, PCB technology. Uh, but then more recently, they've actually partnered with Sharp and have gone through a couple other iterations of uh, using the liquid crystal uh, full assembly on, on uh, TFT glass. So this is a thin film transistor technology. And these are some of the early examples of, of the beam patterns that were created. This is very, very early. Um, satellite communication has a huge amount of requirement on, on how tight a beam you can uh, uh, have when you access the satellite. Uh, and it's extremely demanding, probably overly specced, uh, but uh, they, were, they, they have demonstrated that they can, can meet those specifications for, for that communications uh, uh, application. So again, this is Nathan here. Uh, uh, they were started with an idea that uh, they would uh, use this for uh, a few, uh, what they thought were sort of smaller market ideas. But as, it, as the company spun out and some traction was gained, it turned out to be more important than, than we even first had guessed at the beginning. So this is just showing you the, uh, uh, the basic buildup of, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, TFT glass. This is how uh, display technology works. There's a backlight and a polarizer, uh, then glass, and then the uh, layer with the liquid crystal. I think this thing animates. Maybe I can make it animate. Uh, if I can find my mouse. Oh, there it is. OK, great. Yeah, so, uh, so that sort of blinks. And then if you want to take this same technology, that's showing you with the, using ITO where they apply the voltage. This is a buildup then for the case of uh, the antenna. You replace certain of these pieces with metal. Uh, this is where you have your, 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 your change to actually uh, initiate uh, uh, your, your uh, uh, dielectric change. And then you've got elements here, driving elements, and then you have, uh, so it's actually a simpler uh, buildup than it is uh, for, for a flat panel display. So this became the uh, uh, antenna. This is what this looks like. And here's a couple uh, versions of it. And this is the uh, antenna being uh, uh, delivered on the uh, sharp assembly line. This is just exactly how it works. It might be a little hard to see here. But the cost uh, is something to, to, to really uh, talk about, because you can put all of the driving uh, electronics, all of the metamaterial design, the antenna design, on this glass, this TFT glass, it gets uh, uh, assembled at, at Chimeta into the housing. But the glass itself and all that drive is, um, well, actually, probably four antennas. Uh, the base cost is probably could be somewhere uh, about around $1,000. So this is, that's for four antennas. Take that down, you can start to see you could get incredibly low costs if you have a large volume market. Uh, and this is uh, what this uh, looks like when it starts to get put together. Here it's a, they're near, near, it's a little hard to see these, but it, this is a near field scan. So uh, this immediately attracted a lot of customers, 
Uh, and uh, uh, the first sales have been made, the first one's Panasonic, uh, was a $50 million sale for uh, Maritime, that's uh, public information. But even more interesting is uh, a recent work with uh, Toyota, uh, because uh, one of the uh, interesting markets and needs was to have satellite communication f with uh, automobiles, and, and there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the reasons in particular is to deliver car updates. Uh, automobiles really are, are, are running computers or mobile computers, and one of the, uh, the, I think the top reason for recalls is software updates. So currently they have, uh, uh, the, the car companies have solutions to update uh, the software in cars, but it's not ubiquitous, it doesn't work everywhere, and they have to work through 130 different uh, 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 service providers. And they would like satellite communication to be uh, just uh, one, uh, one method of, of uh, providing these updates. So this is a Mirai uh, concept car. Uh, it's a hydrogen fuel cell, uh, and it was, uh, this is uh, Nathan and someone from Toyota at the Detroit Auto Show uh, showing how they might integrate uh, uh, the Kymeta antenna into this, uh, in, in this case it's the roof. Uh, so if you were to walk up to this, you'd see that uh, there. And uh, uh, they actually drove a forerunner across the country from Seattle, stopping at different uh, of their customers, and they came over to Duke. So it's, it's very rare when you uh, see a technology uh, that uh, was created at, uh, you know, in, in the lab actually drive up uh, and, and deliver itself to you, which is, it was pretty cool. So we had a nice day when uh, had some talks and things like that when they came to visit. That's the forerunner. Uh, so that really is a very large market application and a great transition uh, for metamaterials. Uh, again, the market will decide if this is viable in the end. I'm not promoting this or uh, uh, one way or the other. I'm just saying metamaterials are, are going to be in, in a product. If the product is successful, it depends on a lot of things like uh, price, competition, many other factors. Uh, but it's, it's important to, to at least take that, uh, uh, make that attempt. So uh, I wanted to come back to uh, why uh, uh, phased arrays are not the, the necessarily what you want to use. Here's a comparison of the architectures. Uh, this is a metasurface antenna architecture. And in all cases, you can write a, uh, uh, an array factor. Uh, this would be for a, a passive phased array. Um, and the interesting thing about passive phased arrays is they're not really passive. So a phased array will have a bunch of antenna elements uh, backed by phase shifters. Each phase shifter has to be powered. Uh, typically, they cost a fair amount. Um, there's been a long uh, line of, of uh, suggestions that uh, phase arrays will get inexpensive at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. It may. Uh, a phased array will uh, really just controls phase. Amplitude is set by some feed network, uh, so they're a little bit uh, tricky to design. Uh, but they kind of look like this, and even doing nothing, they draw a lot of power because all these phase shifters have to be uh, uh, powered, so it's not really passive. Uh, you can have things like active phase arrays, which are fantastic devices. They're sort of the ideal, uh, but they now contain two amplifiers in each uh, transmit uh, receive uh, uh, module. So you have these TXRX modules. Uh, now you've got three, at least three elements that are active drawing power. Uh, and you can control amplitude and phase shift uh, so that you can really get almost anything you want. Uh, but again, these consume a lot of power. They typically cost, uh, I don't know, on the order of a half million is not a, an unreasonable number for a, a USA. And they're typically used in high-end applications. There is no way at this point you could really consider large uh, aperture antennas uh, using phased arrays or AESAs because uh, of the cost. So the metasurface antennas I've shown you, uh, you give up a little bit. Uh, you have a single feed, just one amplifier in this case. Uh, all of this is passive, so these antennas can be run off of a USB port, for example. They don't draw a lot of power just to do this change in the elements. And uh, uh, you can actually get more control than, than we even anticipated. Uh, your phase shift comes largely, largely from your reference mode. Uh, and now you're either changing the amplitude here, which gives you an amplitude hologram, the concept is holography, or you can actually change the phase, you have some control over phase. So you've got uh, actually more uh, degrees of freedom than, than uh, you might expect. And in the end, using things like uh, liquid crystal uh, uh, um, 
technologies or other types of, of, of tuning that become more mature in terms of manufacturability, uh, the result is that uh, you can get a very low cost device and actually start to think of consumer markets or large scale markets that you couldn't otherwise. And just to compare them, here's uh, what, it, what one of these dishes look like. Uh, they're actually really big and really heavy and have a lot of uh, mechanized components. Uh, this is a phased array and this is a, a great application for a phased array on the front of a jet where uh, you'll pay a premium for this kind of performance. In fact, you have to have it. Um, so this is an AESA. Um, and then this is a, a comparison of the Kymeta antenna. So since then, uh, Kymeta was the first example of commercialization. Uh, we started looking at radar, uh, uh, really just uh, general uh, wireless communication uh, and imaging, and we found opportunities in all of those areas, and so we've since spun off uh, companies in each of these areas. So Echodyne uh, evolved as the next company to do millimeter wave imaging, uh, then Echodyne is doing radar, and uh, Pivotal is now doing uh, communications. Um, all of these companies have customers and they're going to make a, a, a real attempt. Uh, and and uh, so we'll see what happens. So I, let me check my time. Five minutes. Okay. So I actually think I will not uh, go through what I was going to go through. I think I'll kind of stop there just to show uh, an example from uh, 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 Echodyne. This is, this is their radar system. And again, they're going for very low price points. They're using um, uh, semiconductor technology because radars have to be fast. They can't be slow. Uh, liquid crystal isn't super slow, but it's on the order of, it's not going to beat a millisecond by very much. If you need microseconds or, or faster, then you really need to go back to uh, um, a, a design that uses a, a semiconductor. And uh, in this case, uh, the question you might ask is, well, again, do you have a benefit? Now you're using semiconductor. It starts to sound like antennas that you may know about. But again, the architecture is different uh, and allows you a much more compact fa factor, much lower power draw. Uh, and uh, you know, the other issue with phase arrays is often, if, because they have so many active components and they require cooling and they have to have an entire uh, closed uh, circuit cooling system embedded with them, uh, that's not the case on something like this. Uh, so this is now being looked at for drone markets and, and applications where you don't need a full uh, phased array system. Um, so I had an example to go through. I don't think I will. I'll just show you the, the first picture. Um, it's uh, the, the stuff that's being done at Echodyne I, I can't go into, but there's a, we, we had a, a, just an interesting exercise to see if we could use uh, a dynamic aperture, a holographic aperture for uh, uh, satellite imaging, uh, millimeter wave imaging. Uh, so this is for synthetic aperture radar. Uh, upshot is you start to consider the, the, the details, and it's actually kind of fun. You have to learn a lot about the, this uh, particular uh, uh, system and, and what's being done uh, to find out where the benefit is. But it turns out there is a benefit. And when, one day when I have a talk just based on uh, uh, satellite imaging, I'll, I'll go into that. Also, uh, I can just jump down. Let me see if I can just jump down. Because um, I still have these slides here. Uh, one, no, I'm going to guess that's it. It's all in Spanish here, the keyboard, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, um, I'll just show you this picture. This is a. a Hmm. I lost my mouse. I just want to show that. Okay. Nope. Well, where'd it go? Usually it's. Oh, that started over. <laughs> it's there. Ah, here. Might have been just quicker to, to flip through. Okay, let me do. Let me just do that one randomly. Let me do that. <laughs> okay, I'll do it this way. Yeah. Yeah. The number. I'll do it this way. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, we have to zip through again. Just a couple of quick pictures. Hope I didn't overdo it. Okay, here we go. 
So this is uh, uh, just a simple antenna we made up in the lab. It's not uh, fancy like the ones that are being produced. Uh, this is uh, uh, a couple of diodes on a CELC. Uh, this is a design of it. Uh, so we made our own little uh, 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 1D uh, aperture here for satellite imaging. And um, uh, this just shows you that uh, uh, you can create beams uh, by, by just changing the distribution. So uh, th these, I think, were random modes for, for one application. Uh, this is uh, for, for the SAR application, the fact that we can create beams. This is showing a spotlight SAR application. I don't have time to explain all that, just to show you some, some pictures that you can make. Uh, this is uh, 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 wires that are bent to, say, Duke. And here we have uh, the images created and the smiley face and images created using uh, uh, SAR type uh, uh, processing. And then uh, another project that we've had is to use uh, a holographic metasurface uh, to, for, for uh, uh, security imaging, uh, so looking at people. And this is actually an interesting uh, application because it requires us to act, build an entire system and scale up some of the concepts. Oftentimes you'll see people looking at point sources or small objects, but to look at a full human target is a, uh, is a difficult task to maintain a coherent aperture using metamaterials. And so just to show you our, our uh, in a very few couple steps, this is, uh, a, again, this is, I can't go into the details here, but this is an imaging application, uh, very simple targets that we started with uh, on our way to ultimately uh, a situation like this, uh, which is uh, actually the um, uh, form factor that was uh, uh, requested by the Department of Homeland Security and TSA uh, for the future. They wanted very inexpensive panels uh, that would do the imaging uh, and apertures, uh, and they want it to be very, very low cost, extremely low cost. So this is what one would ultimately like uh, and, and what we had been developing these uh, apertures for, and there's a few scenarios of why they want those. Uh, and I just wanted to go to the very end. Oh, I didn't put it in. Sorry. Okay. Well, this is on the way to scale up. Uh, the next talk you ever see will have the, 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 our, our latest images. Uh, this is Jack Hunt, who was a student that, whose project this was initially. Uh, but you can see that uh, we've put together uh, a bunch of metamaterial panels uh, and done all the back-end electronics, all the RF electronics to actually turn this into a device. Uh, and currently, we have actually pretty good uh, uh, images of humans. I, I, I don't have them here. It's probably just as well because they need to be cleared, uh, and they're not cleared yet. But uh, uh, it, it works, uh, again. Whether it's competitive or not uh, is a question that has to be answered uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the light of, of competition and, and other uh, factors. But the metamaterials technology, the things that we're all working on, uh, actually are being used every single day now and for very applied research uh, and for uh, products that hopefully will enter the marketplace and, and be part of our lives. So uh, this is what I've been working on the past few years. I fully expect to get back to the science and some of the things that uh, are, are interesting just for uh, at the basic level. But this talk is just to tell you that all these things are important. Um, the people that do this work behind the scenes actually read all the papers that are coming out of this community. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to more years of, of more science and, and more transition. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, David. Uh, great talk, indeed. Uh, questions? Uh, okay, uh, let me try to reach you. <laughs> oh, okay, from here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it, uh, it's a very great talk. Uh, my question, or actually my comment, is about the phase array that I don't feel it is a right or a fair comparison because yes, phase array, they're expensive, but they exist for a long time. One of the big merits we get from them, you can control in time. So because you feed it and because you have control on each element, you can control them in time, which we don't have it with this design. So in microwave, we have dish antenna, then we have phase array that we can control in time, then we have a reflect array, which I feel this metal surface is mainly like a reflect array, basically, just changing the elements. 
Why do you say it's uh, why do you say it's not uh, changeable in time? Because with the phase array, uh, we we control each element by element. So you can control each element. And yeah, the amplitude the, and phase in e time. Each element is controlled here independently and can be. All these are in time. But, but if you do it with a with the feeding, then it's gonna be like the phase array. I mean, if it's if everything controlled by one feed, right? And then if you cannot control each element, then it's not the phase array that we can control each element in time, basically. You, you can, so it's a different concept. I'll agree with you that, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, phase arrays are, are irreplaceable for certain applications, uh, but applications where you'd want a reconfigurable antenna uh, that don't require all of the uh, properties of a phased array uh, there was no solution for uh, because of the expense of those, those types of uh, systems. I, uh, th these are configurable in time, but it's a holographic concept rather than the traditional phased array concept. Uh, but we can talk more about the, the differences there. Well, uh, okay. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, very nice talk, David. Um, I just have a comment. You discuss only of meta surface as application. Uh, did it mean that uh, the concept of meta material when they are volumic has no industrial application? What you show is only meta surface right. and it is only tunable meta surface or controllable meta surface. Do you think that Passive metasurface, which was not controllable, or um, volumic metamaterial have also practical application. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, an off ramp uh, to find something that could be commercialized along the way. Um, I think volumetric metamaterials uh, have a role, but uh, it was just easier to start and 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 really profitable to start with uh, uh, looking at what you could do with meta surfaces just because of the advantage. Um, if you want to start making things reconfigurable and adding the third dimension, uh, that's going to be a harder uh, uh, challenge. Uh, it, I think it's eventually going to happen. I think things like 3D printing uh, uh, really are going to do a lot for three volumetric metamaterials. And I think there will be applications there, but uh, this is just the first off-ramp. And, and everything I've shown you is, revolves around uh, one of the initial concepts. We haven't even considered what more can be done. Uh, but we wanted to, to, to try to get something going. We want to keep the field alive. And so this uh, at least shows that there is things that, that can generate customers and, and people interested commercially. Uh, so. I'm still a, a big proponent of volumetric metamaterials, and, and uh, there's a lot there, I think, for the future. So let me actually finish with some comment and to say that, as probably many of you who try to uh, bring to real-world applications some scientific uh, results, know that it's basically a mission next to impossible to accomplish. So, and David, who did really, truly pioneering contribution to the field of metamaterials, and now working on this really, really difficult thing to do, bringing it to real world applications, we should all appreciate a lot his efforts and wish him best luck in this. Thank you, David.